In the icy grip of Davis Strait, a frigid expanse of ocean separating Canada and Greenland, an unyielding pounding noise shatters the silence, echoing through the dense marine fog. Sergei Anonov sits in his helicopter, clad in a well-worn red neoprene survival suit. After traversing 42 days, 21,000 miles, and two continents, he seeks a moment of respite. Unzipping the suit to his waist, he sits bare-chested, oblivious to the impending danger. Then the sputtering starts. His helicopter, a modest 400 kilograms Robinson R-22, is far from imposing. Sergei's experienced ears recognize the sputtering as a warning. The belt transferring power from the engine to the rudder blades has just snapped. He knows without a doubt that the helicopter is going down. Frantically, Sergei engages auto rotation, a safety feature that allows the craft to glide earthward. From an altitude of 3,000 feet, the helicopter plummets at a harrowing 50 feet per second. It isn't until a mere 700 feet above the partially frozen sea, with only seconds to spare, that the helicopter breaks free from the fog's grasp. He steers toward an ice flow, quickly realizes he won't make it, and tilts the craft for the safest possible impact, landing the skids on the churning waters below. Aware that the spinning blades could easily sever his head, Sergei leans to the left, tipping the helicopter just enough to shatter the blades against the unforgiving sea. The engine dies, but now the machine starts to sink. Icy water floods the cockpit, enveloping Sergei's exposed chest and rushing down his unzipped survival suit. His gear begins to float, plastic fuel tanks, a bag of clothes, but the most vital items are suction cupped to the windshield, two GPS trackers, one distress beacon, and a satellite phone. Hidden behind his ankles lies a deflated life raft housing a survival kit with three flares, half a liter of water, and a minuscule box of protein tablets. In an instant, the freezing water reaches his neck, leaving him with a split-second decision to make. The phone can summon help. The beacon and GPS tracker can lead rescuers to his location. But none of these will matter if he can't stay afloat. Sergei lunges for the raft, but it's trapped. He swims out the door, then dives back into the partially submerged helicopter, submerged in the inky, salty, sub-zero water. Desperation fuels him as he frees the raft and surfaces, gasping for air. With the ice flow a daunting 160 feet away, he begins his arduous swim, dragging the raft with one hand and using the other to propel his waterlogged frame through the treacherous waves. Beneath him, the waters teem with danger. Killer whales and the elusive Greenland shark lie in wait. After a torturous three-minute swim, Sergei reaches the flow. Yet the ice, two feet thick and unforgiving, proves an obstacle in itself. The weight of his waterlogged suit renders him incapable of hoisting his legs over the jagged edge. Each attempt only leaves him with scraped skin and blood streaming down his forearms, mingling with the frigid sea. Finally, he locates a smoother section, presses his bare chest against the ice, and uses his nails like claws to shimmy atop the frozen expanse. Now completely soaked and exposed to the biting Arctic wind, he shivers violently, a desperate automatic response to generate heat. His trembling hands struggle to remove the suit. Once free, he flaps it vigorously, attempting to expel the water. It is then, a mere 15 minutes since the belt snapped, that he stands on the ice flow in just his running shoes and underwear, and the gravity of his situation becomes all too clear. Sergei Anonov is marooned on a slab of ice in the Arctic Circle, without a locator beacon, phone, or any substantial supply of water. The dense fog will shroud him from potential rescuers. Night will fall, hypothermia will set in, and the formidable creatures that inhabit this primordial realm may soon come calling. His gaze sweeps over the dark, churning waters. With each passing minute, he drifts farther from where his helicopter plunged, diminishing his chances of being found. On June 13, 2015, when his Robinson R-22 took to the skies from an airfield 20 miles outside Moscow, 49-year-old Sergei Anonov was the proprietor of a Moscow rubbish and recycling company. He had already achieved five world aviation records in the R-22, but this endeavor was far more ambitious, to become the first person to circumnavigate the globe solo in a helicopter weighing less than one metric ton. The Federation Aeronautique Internationale had only ever recorded one successful round-the-world solo helicopter flight. However, 
That pilot flew a heavier craft and had support aircraft trailing him. Save for a few friends monitoring his progress online, Sergei was undertaking this monumental journey alone. It was this record that would secure his place among the legends. His journey took him across Siberia to Alaska, then southward through the western United States before zigzagging across the American heartland. His days commenced at dawn and often ended in darkness, averaging 500 miles per flight. Sergei refueled at local and regional airfields, subsisting mainly on fast food and resting in modest accommodations. As he traversed America, he became acquainted with its diverse communities, from the likes of Sydney, Montana, to Guntersville, Alabama. The locals proved friendly, with some even offering him fuel. He entered Canada near Montreal, crossed the remote expanse of Quebec, and soared over the Hudson Strait to Iqaluit, the capital of the Inuit territory of Nunavut. On that fateful 42nd day, he lifted off from Iqaluit, a mere 3,000 miles from home, and the promise of eternal glory. Stranded and shivering, Sergei allows himself a few moments of regret for his mistakes. If only he had dived once more to retrieve a GPS tracker or the distress beacon. If only he had managed to land on the ice floe, then perhaps he could have summoned a mechanic to repair the R-22 and still claim the record. But such thoughts are futile now. Laboriously, he pulls on the damp survival suit, creating a barrier between him and the merciless wind. Yet, the suit remains soaked, and his body continues to tremble violently. Fumbling with the cord, he inflates the life raft after several attempts. He secures it to his leg to prevent it from being whisked away by the gusts. Using the raft as a makeshift windshield, Sergei lies beneath it, flat on his stomach. This is not the bone-chilling cold of lingering too long on a ski slope. This is the cold that breeds gangrene, induces cardiac arrest, and causes brain death. Sergei tries to walk around his ice island, hauling the raft behind him, but he quickly becomes short of breath. Nerve and muscle fibers falter in the frigid conditions. Realizing the best course of action is to conserve heat and energy, he lies back down under the raft. Around 3,000 miles away in San Francisco, Andrew Kaplan, a Russian-American friend of Sergei's, is among those monitoring the journey online. Kaplan notices that one of the GPS trackers indicates the helicopter's speed has come to a standstill. He contacts another pilot friend in Moscow, Michael Farik, despite the late hour. Together, they begin calling rescue services. Finally, Kaplan manages to secure assistance from the Joint Rescue Coordination Center in Halifax, Canada. Halifax dispatches two C-130 Hercules aircraft to the pilot's last known position. However, it's too late in the day for an exhaustive search. They also contact the Pierre Radisson, a 323-foot Canadian Coast Guard icebreaker commanded by Captain Stéphane Julien. Yet there is a complication. The vessel is at least a day away, guiding a freighter into Iqaluit. With no other icebreakers nearby, Captain Julien cannot abandon his post without jeopardizing the freighter and its crew. Understanding the severity of Sergei's situation, Captain Julian cannot let the stranded pilot perish. Three hours later, after the freighter has been safely led out of the ice and can navigate to Iqaluit unaided, the CCGS Pierre Radisson is instructed by JRCC Halifax to head toward the last known position of the downed helicopter, making its way toward Davis Strait. Sergei remains oblivious to all of this, as well as the formidable predator that has now set its sights on him. Somewhere in the Davis Strait, one of Earth's apex hunters stands upright, swaying its head back and forth. It can detect a seal buried under several feet of snow or a decaying whale carcass from 20 miles away. But this unfamiliar scent leaves it puzzled, having never encountered a middle-aged Russian before. With its characteristic pigeon-toed gait, the polar bear sets off to investigate. The summer before, in nearby Arctic Bay, 31-year-old Adrian Arnoyumayuk and his 26-year-old brother-in-law embarked on their annual hunting expedition. On the first night, they set up camp on an ice floe. The next morning, they were awakened by a 450-kilogram polar bear tearing their tent apart. Although both men survived, they sustained severe injuries. In the Arctic, such encounters often conclude in tragedy rather than survival. About four hours after plummeting from the sky, Sergei remains on his stomach inside his makeshift shelter, 
when he hears heavy breathing and the crunch of snow. Cautiously, he peeks out from under the raft and spots the bear, its fur damp from swimming between ice flows. Hiding beneath his raft, Sergei hopes the beast will leave. It doesn't. The creature sniffs the air, its snout bobbing up and down as it lumbers straight toward him. The bear is now close enough for Sergei to see its black foot pads and toenails. Biologists would say that at this point the bear's motives could be hunger or curiosity, both of which spell danger for the pilot, as polar bears often explore their curiosity with their teeth. If I confront the bear face to face, I will die, Sergei thinks. From deep within, a primal and spontaneous impulse surges forth. He leaps up, flings off the raft and charges at the beast, arms flailing, roaring as loudly as he can. Astonishingly, it works. The bear flees. But Sergei doesn't stop. He pursues the bear to the very edge of the flow, the raft still tethered to his leg and bouncing behind him. The bear deftly leaps onto a neighboring slab and gazes back at Sergei, who continues to scream furiously. The bear sits down, scrutinizing the pilot in silence. Sergei's roars persist, now expressing not only his defiance toward the bear, but also his overwhelming helplessness. For a full minute, the bizarre encounter unfolds, man roaring, beast observing. Then the bewildered bear rises and ambles off into the Arctic fog. The euphoria and adrenaline from the confrontation with the bear are short-lived. The hours drag on, and minutes feel like an eternity. Suddenly the sound of an airplane. Sergei can't see it through the fog, but with his awkwardly gloved hands he seizes one of the three flares, aims it at the noise, and pulls the cord. A brilliant orange-red flame shoots into the sky. Sergei hears the plane arc directly overhead before continuing onward. The flare burns for 30 seconds before fizzling out. Evening approaches, and the cold intensifies, a deep, raw, relentless gnawing. Sergei divides his protein tablets, approximately 2,000 calories, into portions for three days. After that, he reasons, he'll be dead. Humans can endure more than three weeks without food, provided they have water. Sergei possesses only half a liter that accompanied the raft. He's been urinating frequently in the survival suit, a fleeting, liberating warmth. However, if he doesn't replenish his body fluids, dehydration will impair his metabolic function, and his heart will eventually fail, leading to his demise. About 200 miles away, the Pierre Radisson, dispatched on a rescue mission by Sergei's friends who were monitoring his progress online, finally reaches an expanse of open water. Captain Julian surges ahead at the ship's maximum speed, 16.5 knots per hour. In the morning, another plane. Although the fog still obscures the aircraft, Sergei lights his second flare. No luck. Yet he employs the still hot flare casing to puncture holes in his survival suit at the tip of each foot. Now the accumulated urine can drain directly onto the ice. Such small things can enable a man to survive. Then the bear returns. Once more, Sergei flails, roars, and chases the beast. It works again, but without food and drained by relentless shivering, he's even more exhausted than before. Morning transitions into afternoon. Near the flow's edge lies a depression in the ice, brimming with mesmerizing aquamarine water. Sergei positions his life raft, creating a makeshift waterbed. He lies down and dozes, memories swirling backward until the familiar crunch of snow rouses him. The bear approaches for a third time, its colossal snout sniffing the air, detecting the human presence beneath the neoprene fabric. Sergei scares it off once more, then stumbles back to the raft and crawls beneath it. He lacks the energy to fend off the bear if it returns again. He's never contemplated suicide before, but the Arctic's frigid, unforgiving environment has transformed Sergei's mind into a frozen mass of fear and doubt. He doesn't want to be consumed and digested by a polar bear. He'd rather die on his own terms. Twenty-five hours after departing from the freighter, battling a one-knot current and narrowly evading towering icebergs and submerged ice chunks known as growlers, the Pierre Radisson steams into the ice-flow-strewn expanse of the Davis Strait where Sergei Anonov vanished. Though two military aircraft and one government plane had been dispatched, their search was hindered by low visibility due to fog. Aboard the Pierre Radisson, all available hands are on deck. Tension fills the air. In just a few hours, darkness will fall, rendering a rescue impossible 
and leaving Sergei to endure another frigid night on the ice. Then, as if by a miracle, the fog dissipates. Captain Julian contacts Halifax to relay the sudden change in weather, but their planes, stationed over 200 miles away in Ikaluit, won't be dispatched again until morning. With only an hour of daylight remaining, Julian trusts his intuition and sends the ship's GC-366 helicopter into the sky with two observers. Back on the bridge, a third navigation officer spots a red light on the ice. Julian takes a compass bearing and navigates towards the point. The rescue helicopter is alerted. They catch sight of the final glimmer of light from Sergei's last flare. Though no bears occupy the flow, Sergei is once again running, waving, and screaming. That night aboard the Pierre Radisson, 36 hours after the R-22 crashed into the ocean, the pilot is treated to a salad with olive oil and freshly smoked salmon. Everyone wants to shake his hand and snap a photo with him. He complies, even though he'd rather not be remembered this way. This is an inadequate legacy. As he smiles for the phone cameras, he's already contemplating the new R-22 helicopter he'll purchase and how he'll pack it differently, ensuring emergency equipment is easily accessible. And his thoughts drift towards the summer, when he'll once more guide a helicopter into the sky, steering it towards the other side of the world. Thank you so much for watching. We appreciate your time and hope you enjoyed the video. If you liked what you saw, be sure to check out the other great content on our channel. Your support means the world to us, and we can't wait to bring you more. Thank you again, and see you in the next video.